Most all of you in here at some level and in shape in your life have been exposed to the concept of evangelism. Some of you may have heard about it when you were growing up. Some of you may have even practiced some form of it in, in your life. But, but this morning, I want you to forget everything that you know about it. And, and not because what, what we're teaching is, is, is better than any other method, but, but because what we need right now is to look at evangelism with very, very fresh eyes to come brand new to the discussion, as if you have been invited to the table to discuss and experience what this means for the very first time in your life. I want you to pretend that you are all brand, brand new Christians. You just accepted Christ as your Savior in Sunday school, and you have come into here recently having the gospel entered into your life and into your mind, and you are excited about first Jesus Christ. And through that gospel and the realization of the difference that it's made in your life, now you are beginning to say, okay, here is what evangelism can be. Um, in my life, I have experienced all kinds of moments of evangelism. When I was in the fifth grade, I, in Jordanden, Texas, I, in, in the elementary that I was going to, I had a best buddy, and I went to his house to spend the night, and, uh, and I stayed the weekend with him, and, and he was a great friend. And one day, I, it, I know that it was a Saturday, and it was the summertime, and as we played and visited and talked, there was this moment, and it was unexpected, and he just started spontaneously telling me about problems he was having in his family. Fifth grade, he started telling me that his parents were arguing a lot, that, uh, that he was scared because at nighttime they fought really, really hard, and he didn't know if they were going to get a divorce, and he told me about his sister who had recently been in a car accident, and he was telling me all of these things, and, and, and in the middle of it, I don't know why, I don't know how, I, I, I simply said, um, do you know what helps me when I'm sad or when I'm struggling and when I'm hurting and he said what and I and I all I said was that Jesus loves me and I believe he died for me and simply when I said the word Jesus my friend began to cry he he began to to, to real tears from this little fifth grade boy were, were pouring down from his face and and there is something powerful about the name Jesus Christ. The name all by itself, all by itself is miraculous. And I simply said, Jesus loves me and I believe he died for me. And, and I said, and I think he loves you too. And I said, would you like to give your life to Jesus? And he said, yes. And I tried to help him to pray through it, and I don't know exactly what I prayed or how I prayed. I, I would imagine that if we were watching it today on our screens, we would think, yes, that's a fifth grader way of looking at all of it. I did my best, but in that moment, my, my, my best buddy um, said, I believe in Jesus Christ, and I'll give my life to him. It hasn't always gone like that for me. In 1994, I was a missionary at South Padre Island. And um, if any of you have been to South Padre Island, I bet you weren't there to do missionary work. Uh, I was there, and, and I spent the whole summer working for the Island Baptist Church. And the first day, first day, my, my pastor, who I absolutely love, greatest mentor in my life, he takes me out onto the beaches about 9 in the morning. And he says, um, I, I ask him, what do I do? And he said, Ross, all day long, lots and lots of people are going to come on the beach and I want you to tell them all about Jesus Christ. And he gave me a bologna sandwich and drove away. <laughs> I, 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 I struggled and I, I learned and, and, and tried to work through it all. Uh, th th there was a man who came on the beach and he was a dude wearing a thong. And I struggled, man, with, with all of that. How, how do I deal with it? And uh, uh, slowly I got a little better, a little better, a little better at all of it. I've had, I've had my ups and downs through all of these things. But I've come to this realization, all that I've just shared with you happened 35 years ago, 
30 years ago, 25 years ago, and the reality today is different. Our world has changed. People, when they hear Christians, when they hear Christians speak, when they hear Christians, our ideas, they, it automatically does something in their mind that's different the way than it was 30 years ago. Today's church cannot rely on old processes of evangelism that may have worked then. I, I'm telling you today, the church of Jesus Christ needs a new process of evangelism that energizes us, that helps us, something that is effective, something that's practicable. But here's the only things we've ever been exposed to. I'll tell you. In evangelism, I, I've seen in this day and time two kinds of uh, opposing ideas. One, you have the fundamentalist idea of evangelism, this really hard kind of um, confrontational approach where, where, where you're taught the, that you have to get somebody to say these things, and when you're talking to them, if they cannot tell you the exact time, the exact date that they said these words exactly like this, then it's your job to make them say it or to get them to say it. This kind, you, you go up to them, kind of grip them by the collar, and you help push them across the line. This kind of fundamentalist approach to evangelism. That, that getting them saved is everything that you're supposed to do. Now, that's one extreme, and I've been exposed to that. Some of you have as well. And that's why many people today, when they think evangelism, they're seeing that kind of method, and they don't want to have anything to do with it, which brings us from the fundamentalist position of evangelism to the liberal position of evangelism. And you know how liberals engage evangelism? They do nothing. They don't say a single word about hardly any of it. They're so scared of all of it, and, and, and how are people going to respond? And, and, and I don't even know if it's ethical or right. And so what happens is in the church, we're caught between these two things. You have a fundamentalist, confrontational approach that's intimidating. It's not natural. It's hard. Or, well, nothing. And so we're in need of something different today. Studies conducted by the Pew Research Institute and Gallup Poll and the Barna Research Institute are all saying the exact same thing, that the church of Jesus Christ is declining and people who believe in Jesus as their Lord is declining all over the nation and all over the West. So what are we going to do if less people claim this magnificent Christ is Lord, but we are given no real ability besides doing nothing on one side or doing it poorly on the other side. How do we manage all of this? And, and because of that, we, we are faced with all these challenges. And that's why many believers today don't think there is any way to actually do it well. I read a story, I read an article talking about research that said that the majority of Christians today feel that evangelism is wrong to practice at all. So while the Bible says, yes, you can do this, Christians feel like, no, 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 we can't, we, we, we don't, we, we don't know how. And so, in the middle of all of this, First Baptist Marble Falls, we are creating something better something exciting, something that can moderate all of this. And we're not just doing it for ourselves, but maybe, just maybe, if what we're creating in here during this time is going to make a difference in your life, then what if, y'all, what we're doing makes a difference all over the state and nation? Where churches everywhere start to say, you know what, can we adopt that? And we'll say, man, if, if our bullets fit your gun, it's good. And so what we're doing is good for all humanity. We've created a new approach. Welcome to Excited to Share. A new approach, a new idea that's going to be natural and different. Here is what we're not going to teach you to do. Um, I have a video from, from our beloved friends, the Skit Guys, who, who've been here in our church with us before. And, uh, and they have something to share with you about evangelism, um, about how not to do it, and so this is what we're not training you all to do. Watch this. Uh, 
Evangelism is not for the weak, all right? I should know. I wrote a whole book about it, self-published. Most Christians, they are just good for bake sales and potluck dinners. But I'm telling you this right now. It takes a lot of moxie to grab a non-believer by the shirt collar and throw him in the front doors of a church and say, Hey, try living out your heathen life in front of a holy God that way. It is like holy water on a vampire. That's divine intervention, my friend. Repent for the kingdom of the Lord is nigh. Come to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, sir, it sounds like you're really passionate about Jesus. I am. <laughs> um, and you should also be Okay. passionate about the Lord. Sir, if there's... You need to get sanctified or chicken fried. Can we... You need to get with the Lord or d drive a Ford. Sir, we... Get right or get left. I share my faith. Okay, that's a lie. People don't even know I'm a Christian. I want to, again, another lie. I hardly shower, much less have the will to do anything else. Mm, okay, now if there was pizza and ice cream every time there was faith sharing, I'd do it. That's a lie, I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> again, another lie, I'm just too cheap to buy dairy. Bottom line, sharing my faith makes me sweaty. Uh, tip number 95, um, use big church words like transubstantiation. Heathens get confused easily, and the more confused they are, the more shame they are. The more shame they are, the more apt they are to make a decision for Jesus Christ. I believe it's a responsibility, no, the privilege, no, the glorious privilege of every believer to share their faith with others. That's why I share my faith with everyone I come in contact with. Everyone, really? <laughs> yeah, everyone. How do you do that? Uh, Check out my shirt. Can't read it? Try this glove. Not working for you? How about this bracelet? No comprendo? Vistazo a estos. <laughs> Driving behind me? Read my bumper sticker. It says, it's okay if you follow close. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> oh, you're my waiter or waitress? I got a tip for you. Surprise! It's the gospel. I mean, what do you want? Money or eternity? <laughs> I also use these tracks. <laughs> so what about talking to people about your faith? I, I don't really like people, but I love Jesus. <laughs> Scripture mint? Hi, my name is George. And I'm Jorge, and together we're George and Jorge. Right, right. Uh, what we like to do is to take secular songs and reprogram them. Yes, the purpose is for evangelism. We like to take songs to the unbelieving world and make it believable. Right, right. Let us give you a sample right now. goodness this is so <laughs> this is not a campaign where we're going to help you memorize a few verses and send you out knocking on everybody's doors it's not a confrontational kind of method where we're going to teach all of you how to beat everybody you talk to in a debate um, it's not the kind of thing where we're going to train any of you how to be a salesman not any of that where it's not going to be gimmicky it's not going to be cliche, and it's not going to be trite, because we can do better than that. We can do better, and the gospel is deserving of something better than that. Our goal is to become naturally, naturally, um, genuinely evangelistic in the way God made you to be. We're going to try to increase our evangelism intelligence which will increase our passion and then our competence, not for a small campaign, but so that you can engage people wherever and however you are in a really wonderful kind of exchange and way, a way that cares about that person. That's what we're trying to work on. And this method will help you to, to share the gospel in a pluralistic society where people are very apt to tell Christians that they are intolerant and that, that, that 
anytime we say anything that we're discriminating against their views and that we're narrow. It helps us navigate these things. But y'all, learning the gospel like this and evangelism like this is going to take more than five minutes. They, like most great, great things in life, there is no shortcut to this kind of competency. It's going to take some hard work. It's going to take you saying, you know what? This is worth it. Whatever I have to move around, however I have to engage it, it's going to be worth it. And it's so worth it, in fact, the Bible says that, that when you follow the Lord like this, Hebrews eleven six, it says that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. How is God going to bring reward? In, in what ways? You yourself, people that you talk to, what does reward look like and feel like? I like the reward that Paul talks about in the verse that Tanisha read earlier in Romans 1.16, where, where Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because, here's the reward, it's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Salvation. This beautiful, magnificent word, salvation, every time you say it, it should drip like honey off of your lips. It's, it's so wonderful and so beautiful. We're going to end in just a moment with talking about salvation. But in order to get there, here is how excited to share is going to help us move forward toward that. There, there are several things that's unique about this approach. And the first thing that's unique is the actual theology that's behind it. There are three theological ideas that we're going to break into these weeks of study. And the first theological idea that really makes it kind of odd is a real emphasis on being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And two, we're going to talk about it in a way that speaks of the grandness and beauty of the gospel by telling the gospel in a way that, that, that's deep and compelling being able to share how, how the wonderful redemptive movement of God is working in history and working right now in our life, and to be able to take pieces of that story and string them together like pearls on a necklace as we communicate it to people. And then last uh, is, is the idea, we're going to do this in a way that is respectful and considerate of other people and their views so that we listen to them and that we can even learn from other people as we talk to them. And y'all, th th those are different kinds of ideas. To talk about the Holy Spirit is a different idea. Now, I want y'all to know this. Whether or not our church becomes evangelistic, whether or not th that movement, however that looks, it's going to do all of us good to concentrate on the Holy Spirit in our life easily enough. Simply the idea that, that God has come into our life and to be cognizant and aware of how the Spirit can move us and lead us, can help us. Too many times we as Christians are trying to be faithful without the indwelling of the Spirit and without concentrating on the direction the Holy Spirit is leading us. And so we'll, we'll focus on that for three weeks, and then we move to the, the big, beautiful story of Christ and how to tell it and how to think through it and apply it to our life. And then we're going to look at the way that it's ethical to, to treat people with respect when we're talking to them and not, not just treat them with respect, but, but it means that we do not have to say more than we actually know. If you try to say the, more than what you know about the Word of God or about how God is moving in our world, it's a lie because we don't know. And it is powerful when we're talking to people to be able to say, you know what, you just asked a good question, you have a good thought, I don't know. When we say I don't know, it's actually more believable because the, the thing that is the, the least believable thing is when we give the gospel in this really nice, nice packaged kind of a sales pitch that if you buy this product, everything in your life's going to work out and isn't it nice and airtight? And y'all know, n nothing works that way. I in your lives, you know that when you follow Christ, it's hard. And, and you know that it, it, giving your life to the Lord does not eradicate all of the pain or all of the struggle. But sometimes we sell Christ to people in a way that makes them feel like, oh, if I say the prayer you're asking me to pray, then, then everything's going to work out. 
and we just make it like that, and, 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 and it's, not, it's not right. There's more to it, isn't there? And so we're going to say it in a way that's deeper than all of that. And so you can expect those three things and to really traffic in it and figure it out. But then, y'all, we're, going to, we're going to look at this uh, evangelism method in these groups called sodalities. And, and they're really important. If you haven't gotten signed up for one, here's the way they work. In your Sunday school classes, you're going to use this book as your curriculum for Sunday school. And each one of you are going to get this book and you're going to read it and you're going to engage in your Sunday school class because you, you, you've been able to read it and you know the direction that the teacher is going. So next week, they're going to teach week two. Well, you have between now and next Sunday to read week two, and this is what it's going to be. Your sodality is different. Now, you can bring these books to your sodality, but this is not your curriculum for the sodality. And let me remind you, the word sodality comes from a Latin word, sodalitas, which means solidarity. We are experiencing solidarity in our desire and passion to be better at evangelism. Solidarity. In your sodality, we're going to watch a video where, where I kind of give a, a summation of the lesson for that day. And then, here's the powerful part. We're going to kind of really rehearse it and practice it in this small group. This is the time in your sodality where you can say, this is my struggle this is what I don't like, this is what's hard about this, or this is what I don't understand, and you, you allow other people to speak into your life with it. This is your group that you're going to really um, work out some of these things. And so starting week six and seven and eight, when we talk about the message of the gospel, you're going to get to practice saying that with a partner. And, and you don't have to do it in your whole group, but your sodality is going to be like a family. It's going to be safe. And, and all of you can work it out that way. But y'all, without the sodality, we cannot be good at evangelism with just Sunday school and just worship. Here, here's why. Sunday school and, and worship time is, is like a big football team, and they come together, and it's like the field house where the coach gets the big chalkboard, and he draws out the plays, and he says, all right, y'all got it? And everybody says, yes, we got it. And he says, now we're going to go out on the practice field and we're going to rehearse and practice what I just drew. The practice field is your sodality. Now, it, what won't work is if you just get the plays in the field house and then the coach says, all right, I'll see you all on Friday night. Let's get ready. No, the practice is crucial. It's crucial. Engage that, that group of people. And so the sodality is going to have all of those things. And, and let me also remind you that real discipleship is not simply getting in the classroom and doing a Bible study, y'all. If you come to Sunday school or you come to worship and all you get is a lot of information all the time, but you're not with a group of people that you can really partner in life, living out the gospel, that's discipleship. We have to be able to, to move in a way that's outside of these walls and outside of the typical way of just filling our mind full of more information. We will not be followers of Christ like that. So the sodality is exceedingly important to really press in and live out what we're talking about and to do it together. And so here's the third thing. This is very different in terms of week five. Week five is called the day of empowerment. When you get to, together with your sodality because week five is going to try to help us understand Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, all of the apostles are waiting on God to move in their life before they're able to go out and share their faith. Jesus had already given to them the great commission to go, but he told them to wait. Don't go just yet. Wait. Why does he tell them to wait? They're not ready. The apostles are, are terrified. They're scared. They don't have the ability to go out and do it. it after Jesus um, raises from the grave, the apostles are even seen locking themselves in rooms because they're so scared of what the Romans will do and what the Jews will do to them. It's not a picture of people who are strong and triumphant, ready to go out and conquer the world. It's not. They're just like us, normal people. 
And Jesus says, I want you to go and share my gospel. And immediately we like, ah, how? That's going to get us killed. That's going to get us hurt. That's going to get us laughed at. I don't know what to say. I love people. I don't want to have this kind of tension. How do I do that? God knows. God knows. And he says right in the middle of our panic attack, wait, don't worry. I got a plan. I invented you. I know your heart. I know it. I get it. And so he tells the apostles and he tells us, wait for me because I'm going to send my gift to you. And my gift is what's going to help you in this. So the early church, scared as they were, they they wait and they're praying and they're together. And in the middle of that, all of a sudden, while they're praying and worshiping God and together, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes on them. And the Holy Spirit then leads the way of evangelism. The Holy Spirit gives them the courage. It gives them the words to say and the ability to to begin going out, and the Holy Spirit works in the ears of all the listeners that day. But y'all, all of the movement, 3,000 people came to know the Lord in Acts chapter 2. The reason is not because the apostles were strong, but it's because the Holy Spirit was strong. And so what we're doing is allowing on, day f- on, on, on week 5, the day of empowerment, to have this moment where after we have talked about the Holy Spirit over and over and over again, we're, we're going to say... We all lay hands on one another. Let each person come and kind of sit in the middle of a circle. And we come and we say, dear Lord, will will you please be with Ross? Will you please help him? That that as he encounters friends and encounters people, if you have something that he needs to show somebody the gospel, give him the ability to do it and give other people the ability to hear it as well. And we lay hands on one another and pray that. Y'all, I've had the privilege many, many times in my life of being in these really sacred, holy moments when, when all of you will come into my life and lay hands on me and pray for me. And, and it sustains me. I'm a better dad because of it. I'm able to deal. It, it has saved my life when y'all have done that for me. But I've, I realize this. I've asked some people, have you ever had a group of people to lay hands on you? and to pray for you in the same way. The majority of First Baptist Marble Falls has never felt and experienced that. People will say, well, we'll pray for you. People might pray for you, but to have your intimate friends that you care about come and say, man, bro, here, we're going to lay hands on you and pray that the Lord will help you. Most of you have never experienced the joy of that kind of moment and what it's like. How would you like to experience that? I, I know that it does more than just help us in evangelism, that there are things in your life that can begin to disappear. And and you can be helped by this laying on of hands and the spirit awakening in your life. For instance, you may have asked God to forgive you for something that you did a long time ago, and you have asked him over and over and over for that kind of forgiveness, and yet you know that God has forgiven you, but you cannot forgive yourself for it something that happened in your teens or your 20s or your 30s, and you're still struggling with that kind of thing. And many times we're worshiping this morning as we did, and it's exciting, and you say, God, once again, here I go again with this same old thing. Lord, will you please forgive me? And you'll walk out of here, and Satan will bring it back up to you. Perhaps what you have needed all your life is a group of friends to come around you and to lay hands on you and say, oh, God, Fill this person with everything that you ever promised. Give to them the joy of their salvation and help them to know that that, that you have cast their sin as far away as the east is from the west. May they go forward as a conqueror today. And then you're able to let some of these things go. What, what, What if there is more in what we are talking about than just evangelism? What if it is gonna radically change you your life in all kinds of beautiful ways? Well, we're going to have this moment of Acts 2, the Pentecost day, the day of empowerment. And here's one of the neat things about it. Most of the time in our Christian life, we go throughout our day trying to be faithful, trying to do it, but, but not really in tune with, with what the Spirit wants us to do. It's like we're going throughout our day not being hydrated very well. And, and scientists and everyone says, and, and, and our doctors, they say, you've got to drink more water, you've got to drink more water. Most of us don't. 
We go throughout all of our day not being hydrated. Here, here's my story of this. Um, the, uh, I get kidney stones relatively often. Some of you out here are my stone brothers and sisters, and y'all, y'all feel me in this. We have a nice fraternity, don't we? Um, first time I ever got kidney stones. Well, I thought I was going to die, and, uh, and so I got in the car, and I'm driving myself to the hospital, and that was a pleasant drive. And uh, I pull in, and, and I go in, and, and I'm in the waiting room, man, and, uh, and they say, well, well, we'll get to you. And I'm having kidney stones in the waiting room, and just as I'm about to, I, I'm starting to see the light, and angels are beginning to sing, bring me home. And uh, right then, they finally call my name, and I go in to see the doctor, and they give me all kinds of goodness. Uh, and, and I start to immediately feel better. One of the things that they give me is, is fluid. And they say, man, you're, you're dehydrated, and that helps cause kidney stones. You've got to drink more water, but we're going to hydrate you before you leave. We're going to give you this bottle of stuff, fluid. I don't know exactly what it is, but I know this. Every time I've gone to the hospital to see any of you, you're getting it too. It doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter. You always get fluid at the hospital. And I have come to believe that it is so awesome, I would get a bottle of it every morning if I could. Just hook me up to fluid right now. And the reason I I came out of the hospital that day with all of this fluid And I thought, I came in here thinking I was going to die, and I am leaving thinking that, I mean, I I am stronger and healthier, and I have more energy and more clarity than I have ever, ever had. How do I feel so good? Well, it's because they gave me fluid and pumped me for, I was hydrated, maybe for the first time. (laughs) Hydrated. I think that we don't even know. We, we don't even know when we are dehydrated in the Holy Spirit. And what we need is, is, is to be attuned and to be thoughtful. Man, Lord, give me all that I need for this moment in my days. You cannot be the faithful Christian God's calling you to be without being hydrated with the Spirit of God. And so the day of of Pentecost that will happen on week five, we're going to build, build toward that. And it is unique in this study. Um, It's unique because many times in evangelism training, they'll say, oh, you need to memorize this, 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 and this. And then they'll say, now before we go out, let's say a, a quick prayer about it. And it's not enough. It's like a little token prayer where Unfortunately, we treat the Holy Spirit as if he is this small in a situation where he should be massive. The Spirit goes before us. The Spirit does it all. Now, the last thing is this. In this movement, this is a unique thing, and that is the way that we're going to look at success with all of it. Um, Here's what you can expect. We do not judge our success based on whether or not somebody gives their life to Christ right then when we're talking to them. That, that's not what it is. When we think that, that our job is to get someone saved right then, then we will always end up doing unethical things that's not right for that person. What if you're trying to hurry up and get someone to kind of cross the line of conversion and get them to do something? What if they're not ready to do it? What if there's issues in their life and they're struggling with a lot of things and, um, and, and you're not listening to them, you're just trying to get them to say something and you, you, you hurry them up. If you force somebody to make a decision before they're ready, we are not making disciples of Jesus Christ. We're just getting somebody to do a cheap little prayer. In fact, rather than helping somebody be born again anew and alive as a disciple, we will create stillborn disciples. A stillborn disciple is somebody who may have said at some point in their past that they gave their life to Jesus, but they've never, ever engaged church. They have no idea about the power of community of faith. They don't know about the power of prayer or Bible study. They don't understand what God is doing in our world and historically, and they don't see their part in any of it. 
And the reason is because we did it so poorly. We've created stillborn disciples. And y'all, they're all over our community. We can't create stillborn disciples. And the way is we are patient as we talk about all of it. It's wrong if you force somebody to do something before they're ready. But not only that, it's also wrong if you say more than you know to say. We are not trying to get you to learn about every issue and everything in the whole world so that if somebody asks a question, either you can debate them on it or you can win some kind of thing or teach them about everything. We're not teaching you to do that. You can't do that, and I can't either. We're teaching you to know just your story and what you believe and what the Bible teaches about God in Christ and we're going to do it in a way that is faithful to Scripture. But in all of the other mysteries of our world, we're going to give you the chance to say, you know, I don't know. And when you say, I don't know, it's going to be more believable to them than had you said, oh, well, here's the answer to that. If you give a, a quick answer to somebody's deep, deep pain and their hard questions that they've been processing for 20 years about why their dad walked out on them when they were little, or why they experience um, um, failure after failure after failure, and they can't figure it out, and you're talking to them about that, and they ask you some of these questions, and you start to say, oh, well, here's why. You just trust in God, and don't worry. You know what? Immediately, you've lost. It, it makes your story less believable. When you start to say, oh, well, here's all the answers. So, y'all, we're going to do it better than that. How, how great is that? Amen. And so we're going to do it differently. Our success is not based right then on whether or not somebody gives their life to the Lord. But our success is going to be based on when the Holy Spirit's leading us. We're going to be faithful to obeying. And we're going to tell the gospel in a way that, that's worthy of it, that is beautiful, that is special. And we're going to bring in all of the wonderful moments in a way that, that, that helps people to see it. We're going to be faithful to the actual story. And then we're going to live it out as well. All of that is really important. And when we do it well, the great thing is, is salvation begins to be experienced in people's lives. Um, we started out this way. We're going to bring it to a close this way too. When you think of salvation, what are all of the amazing things that that word brings to your mind? Salvation. Something that, we're, that we know that when we experience the salvation of God, death does not have the final say. Cancer does not have the final say. Addictions don't have the final say. What we learn in this life when we know Christ is that there is life on the other end of this one. Salvation saves our loved ones, our children, our parents. It tells us that when we die right here, that this is not all that there is, that there is hope in this world because of Christ. A fr great friend of mine named Rick from East Texas, I, I performed his marriage when he was you know, very, very young, married a beautiful girl. And they had all of these dreams, and, and it was going to go well for them, and I knew that it was as well. They got married. Their Aggies got married out of Texas A&M, and uh, such a great couple. Six months after they got married, he got a, uh, a diagnosis that he was terminal with cancer, Nothing, hardly anything else they could do. Young. And all of their dreams about having children and uh, having grandkids, and, and, and growing up and growing old together, and, 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 and that they were going to be companions, all of it was lost with that one horrible diagnosis. And now he's, he's going to die, and he has cancer, and they're starting to figure that out. And, and, well, what does that mean? And they gave me a call, and, they, and he wants to talk about the funeral. And so he gives me a call, and he says, Ross, can we visit? And they drive down from where they are to Hondo, Texas. They meet me at the church. And... Uh, and, and he starts telling me about his cancer and about what's about to happen, and he's just so frail at that point. And, and as we talked, I, I said, are you scared about all of it? And, um, 
And he said, man, I'm terrified. I'm terrified of it. He said, I don't want to die. And his wife said, and I don't want him to die either, Ross. What, what do we do? And, um, and I'm trying to think, oh, God, what can give them hope at this moment? Is there, is there, any, is there any good news when all of life is bad, when, when you're stuck in it? Is there, is there any good news? And so I said, you know what? I, I think that there is some good news. And you know what the word good news means? Gospel. What I'm saying is, is, is I think that there is gospel for you. And I said that if you go out and, and, and as cancer begins to take your life, I want you to know that in Jesus Christ, that is not the end of your life. And that the resurrection of Jesus defeats your cancer. The resurrection of Jesus means that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God, neither life nor death, nor the present, nor the future, nor height, nor depth, nor angels, nor demons, or anything else in all of creation can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So your cancer cannot do it. And there is hope for you. And, and, and he said, he said, yes. He said, I don't have any more hope. Um, um, MD Anderson has given me no hope. I don't have it. I want that. And in that moment, he just falls and his wife is weeping and he's weeping and I am too. And he said, Lord, come and, and, and give me life. Save me in all of this. And he experienced salvation this beautiful amazing word and when he said amen he looked up at me and she looked at me and through their tears they began to smile how do you smile with cancer how do you smile being terminal you smile because of the hope of Jesus there is no other way no other way salvation when we become evangelistic, we see and experience this beloved salvation. But it's not just for what happens when you die. It, 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 it's about salvation transforms us in our lives right, right now. And, and what kind of a, a parent you are and a husband and a wife, it, it, it affects you now. Where, Like in Zacchaeus' life when he's dealing with Jesus and he leaps up from the table and he says, right now, I am moving from a person of greed to a person of generosity, and I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've ever robbed anybody, I'm going to pay back four times the amount. And Jesus jumps and he leaps him, uh, uh, up with him, and he says, Zacchaeus, today, salvation. Salvation has come to you. It's not just for the next life. Y'all, it makes a difference now in people's lives. There's a great video called Itao, about a missionary who goes into uh, a tribe to start talking to them about the gospel, and, and, and he builds it up little by little, little by little, gets to know them, learns their language, learns everything about them, and, and, and finally, after months and months and months of getting to know them and um, learning their language and slowly starting to reveal the gospel, he brings them out, and, and he lets them act out parts of the gospel, parts of the Bible story. They don't even know what they're doing, but he's teaching it to them, the story, which we're going to learn to do little by little, and he builds it until he gets to this glorious, wonderful moment where the last day, all of the tribe and all of the village all came out to him, and he says, last week, you experienced the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And you all left in that, in that horrible Friday moment, and it was sad, and it was hitting us, and the person that you were beginning to love and trust had died. And he said, but now we've come back together, and I want to tell you the end of the story. The end of the story is that Christ did not stay dead, but he came back to life. And he is alive in here in your village and in your tribe. And you can have life in him. And all of the oppressive, violent moments of paganism can disappear. You can begin to come together in the life of Christ. And, and, and in the story, 
they, they said that each one of them began to understand and, and it began to click inside of their mind that this glorious Christ could come into their life and save them. And one by one, one of them jumps up in the middle of the, the moment and he cries out in his language, Etau, it means it is true, it is right, and it is good. Etau, Etau. That's his, that's his statement of, I believe it. I'm giving my life to it. And one by one, they all begin to shout out this. And then, at this special moment, the whole village breaks into celebration. They, they begin to lift one another. Every time a new person would say, me too, Ital, they would lift them up onto their shoulders and they would push them all around the whole tribe and they were just dancing because their life was saved. Salvation had come to them. I'm telling you, if you had just received Jesus as your Lord and Savior during Sunday school, and now you have come into this worship time and you're experiencing this for the very first time, and all of you are saying, it's me too. Etau, it is good for me. The celebration that breaks out where salvation comes and it transforms everything in your life. And the way you see things in your worldview, and it begins to come into focus. Etau, it is good. Salvation accomplishes all of that. A few years ago, my little niece gave me a call, and she had just accepted Christ as her Savior, and she called me on the phone, and I said, hello. And, and, and she says, you know, it's me, and she shared her name, and, and, uh, and she said, I have something exciting to tell you, and I say, what? And she says, Uncle Ross, I'm not Pastor Ross to everybody. I just accepted Jesus as my Savior, and she says, and I'm so happy about it. I said, I am too. We are all happy about it, because salvation is the most powerful thing in the whole world. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, because it's good news for people with cancer, and it's good news for people with addictions, it's good news for people who are dying, it's good news because, sal because gospel has the power of salvation for everybody who believes. And that's why we do it. Would you bow your heads with me?